and please put your hands together for Josh Dillon, Hugh Skinner, Jeremy Irvine, Ol Parker, Pierce Brosnan, Stellan Skarsgård, Andy Garcia, Dominic Cooper and Bjorn Ulvaeus. Welcome gentlemen. <laughs> hey guys. Good afternoon. Hello everybody. Um, I'm selfishly going to start things off and then we will open up to you, our lovely audience. So please don't be shy and get the questions in straight away. Mr. Parker, I'd like hey. to start with you, please, if that's okay. Congratulations, first of all, to all of you. The film is just, uh, it's a joy and it's full of optimism and it's what we need in the world. And I felt like I could take on the world when I came out of seeing it. So congratulations to you all. Thank you very much. Um, oh, where did you start with, with this story from Richard Curtis and taking it forward to what we see on screen? I, I had an email from Richard that just said, uh, random question, do you like ABBA? <laughs> and, uh, and I wrote back, who doesn't? And I think I thought he was going to invite me to dinner with Benny and Bjorn, because that's how he rolls. <laughs> and then he said, follow-up question, would you like to write the sequel? And I said, yes, that would be lovely, thank you. And uh, not that it was up to him to offer the job. But um, so that was where I came in. And Scarlett Curtis, his extraordinary daughter, had had the idea of doing a prequel and a sequel. She'd suggested that it be uh, Godfather 2. And so that was what he gave me. And then I came up with the story and then Richard and I spent a very happy uh, time in his caravan in the countryside and we put all our favourite songs up on the wall and just tried to kind of zigzag between them and crowbar them in. I mean Andy's character was invented specifically so that shit could sing Fernando to him <laughs> and so sometimes you figure it out that you, you get to a point and you're like what song would work here and you're like oh that would be cool, that, you know Mamma Mia for example, Jeremy's just broken Lily's heart. Yeah. And so then she sings you know uh, Mamma Mia and, that, and sometimes it's the other way around, the song dictates how you get there. But there is, there is so much heart and emotion and different types of emotion within this story as well. Was that easy to kind of to, to navigate? And Thank you. Uh, well, I think partly that's because um, I had the great gift of writing a sequel with some already known and already loved characters. And so you can just build on. You don't need to establish these things. You can just, it's not 0 to 60. You can start at 60 and crack on from there. Uh, which was a great gift and also it's a tribute both to everybody on stage next to me and to the music that we got to use to have there's so much heart and emotion in what they do and since we're playing their songs all the time then our job is just to try and match that great okay your guys' turn uh, we're going to start at the back this time uh, lady in the blonde with the blonde hair so much and we have one hi uh, this is a question for Bjorn uh, Mamma Mia was certainly a game changer in musical theater and movies. That, that's for sure. It changed the whole industry. So uh, what, have you had a lot of different responses from people that listen to the music and from the theater goers or the movie goers? Uh, do you get any story about anybody saying, this saved my life? Because I've heard it about Mamma Mia. Mm -hmm. Well, could you repeat that last question again because I didn't yes, quite get it. Yes, I've heard from more than one person that Mamma Mia actually saved their lives emotionally, that they were at a certain point and ah, that brought them up. I ha see. Ha have you gotten that ever? Because you should. <laughs> I, I, I get to hear that a lot. It's, it's quite a strange feeling when people come up to you and say that, you know, you, you, can, you have no idea how much our music uh, has meant for us. Um, and emotionally, it's quite difficult to grasp because, I mean, the fact that I'm sitting here today when I, I shouldn't be sitting here because I thought that our music will go into oblivion like two years after we split up, and that is some 35 years ago. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just, you know, very humbled and, and, and grateful, but I, I'm... When I look at myself in the mirror every morning, I, you know, I'm very down to earth. And that, that makes it even more difficult to understand, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've got, you got a microphone there? Yep, I have. Thank you. Um, this is uh, for Pierce and Stellan and for Andy. Uh, Pierce um, and Stellan, what was it like if you could tell us to get back into the flares and the outfits and sort of get back into that vibe? And for Andy, what was it like having Cher serenade you? <laughs> Oh, I think it was the same embarrassing humiliation. <laughs> <laughs> However, we have broad shoulders. And yeah. the, uh, you have no idea how much spandex flattens your genitals. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and, uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we're actors and we know where the jokes are and we know that uh, it's I a magical it's moment. Uh, where the jokes are? Yeah. Yes. Um, listen, this is, this is a movie for me that I will forever cherish in my heart. I mean, it was magical to do it 10 years ago. It was incredible to go around the world and to see the joy that it brought to people's lives. And to, to have that in your career, and to have that gift, uh, it's nothing but uh, gratitude, really. And Andy, to be serenaded by Cher. Last night or in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> Start wherever you wish to. <laughs> it was a great privilege, really. You know, uh, Cher, we've been called such huge fans of Cher not only as a singer, but as an actress. So uh, when I got the opportunity to, when they approached me to, to be a part of it, I was very excited. I learned shortly thereafter that, uh, from Cher, that she sort of picked me out of a bunch. And so that was, that was you know, doubly uh, a, uh, a blessing for me, you know. I have such respect for her. Again, not only as a singer, as we all know, but also as an actress. And, uh, all the people in this cast, some were old friends, like Stalin and others, uh, people I've obviously admired throughout my life. So it's, uh, I'm blessed to be here. It's funny, you know, seeing Andy now, he is Fernando. <laughs> I, I, I sort of conjured up that, that, uh, that right. guy um, 40 years ago or something, right. uh, lying on my jetty looking at a starry sky and writing about Fernando, the freedom fighter. And right now, Andy is him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Benny said the same thing. He said it was his favorite scene in the film where Shar just says, Fernando. <laughs> yeah, it's an outrageous joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Who's got the microphone here? Here we go. If we can get it to the guy over there, and then if we can get the microphone to the lady in the white and blue black shirt. This is also for Andy. Uh, Andy. Of course, she's a legend, and, but you've been singing and acting alongside her. I, I, I was on wonder, what is her secret to be a legend? Because she has a charisma, of course. But what can you tell us that we don't know about Cher? Uh, you know, actually, she's, she's extremely uh, down to earth, you know. And uh, one of the things I think that, that I've always been attracted to her, even from her early days in television with, with Sonny and her and their show, is... And she always she always showed an extraordinary talent as an actress, but I think her sense of humor, the dryness in her sense of humor, to me is so engaging, and uh, and she she has that you know she's so present in in life. She's so aware of everything, and and her commentaries on things are very very funny. I remember when we were doing the film. I just flashed on this. I was experiencing some issues with uh, my back. I kind of tweaked it playing golf here in, in England. And she was giving me some remedies and some things that I should try. And she texted me and said, here, try this. I think it'll be good for you. And she signed it, Ruby, with, a, you know, with like one of those kisses. You know, she <laughs> likes to apparently tweet and text a lot. So I said, Cher, is this you? She said, of course it's me. How many people you know named Ruby? <laughs> <laughs> So that kind of sums her up. <laughs> I have two very short questions. Number one is, uh, and it goes to all, why did you decide to move to Croatia rather than film in Greece again? Uh, it wasn't my decision. It was above my pay grade. Uh, it was an economic decision right. and a shame, I think. It was a, I think the one thing Greece really needs at the moment is an injection of money and tourism, but I think it was to do with the economy. But it was taken uh, by people way more experienced and intelligent than me. Okay, and the qu uh, second question is, was it a deliberate decision to turn Gon Donna into a ghost, or was it something that perhaps she couldn't do all the filming and she wasn't available no, think, all the I think, time? I think, I mean, I think the reason it took 10 years to, to, to get back here is that not every 
story needs another chapter, not every film needs an encore, not every film needs a sequel. And so I think it was about finding a way to tell the most emotional and impactful and meaningful story, and I think it just took a while to find that. And when we did, she was very much part of that decision and delighted by it. I think all these guys, I'm new to this, but all the legacy cast and Benny and Bjorn too, they all have enough integrity and frankly enough money, much as they wanted to do a sequel, not to need to do it, and they were very keen not to sully the memory of the first one. And so it was about finding a way to come back and hopefully tell a story that's worth telling. And that was the story we chose. Hugh, can I ask you a question, please? Yes. I want to ask you about the Waterloo uh, oh. scene, please, because what an incredible musical piece. Um, and how was that for you? And, and what was your preparation for that? And how much fear was there in terms of... <laughs> uh, there was a, a lot of fear. Um, I think <laughs> Anthony Van Last, the choreographer is obviously amazing and did the first film in the stage show as well and I think he's very good at choreographing to individual abilities mm. um, which is why you can see some people cartwheeling and flipping and I'm playing a baguette and riding a trolley <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was fun it's really fun um, we spoke to, to Lily and Jess and Alexa about you know the idea of, of taking on these characters that we know and love from the first film and and not studying them but but, but trying to, to be them, but also their own person as well. And, and for you, what was that like in terms of taking on the, the, younger, the younger Bill? Um, well, we didn't want to do impressions. Mm. Or us, you know, we, we spoke yeah. about that quite early on, because we, we couldn't do them justice, is, the, is why. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I mean, you have to look at like kind of accent and stuff a little bit, but then... I don't know, a certain amount of freedom is good, was helpful, I think, for, for all of us, because... Mm. How was your sailing before you...? Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. Very uh, impressive <laughs> afterwards. Well, now I'm an expert sailor, yeah. <laughs> but I think for me, one example, because like, I asked them all to, you know, study their legacy counterparts. We don't say older cast, we say legacy cast. Mm. Um, to, study their, <laughs> to study their counterparts. And... Um, and then sort of chuck it out the window, but if they could use it at any point. So one example would be when Lily tries on the dungarees for the first time. She comes out and stands there, and she's talking to Jeremy, and I said, just come out and model them. And she went, what does that mean, model them? And I said, like, I don't know, I'm a guy. <laughs> and then she came out and did the dance the dungarees, which Meryl does in the first movie on the jetty. And so it's things like that. When you can bring it in, then it's brilliant, but it shouldn't ever hmm. dominate or be forced in. Jeremy, you've worked with all before, and I was good. I have, yeah. And, I'm a lucky um, man. <laughs> was, was that, when you were approached to take on the role, was that part of the reason of saying yes, of working with all again? I mean, I, I, all knows that he only has to, he only has to ask. So, uh, no, I think, um, I think what all's done, which is so, so clever here, is, you know, you take a movie like this, which, you know, on paper should be very broad, and in this film, you know, he's given it such an emotional heart, um, with a movie that appeals to so many people. And I think that's, you can't sort of underestimate the skill that that takes. And uh, I'd certainly seen that in his writing and directing the first time we worked together. And, uh, you know, when we all first watched the movie for the first time, there were people in the audience who, who, who laughed and also cried. And uh, I think that's, that's amazing that with a movie like this that you can actually make an audience feel that moved and, in, and connected to the characters. Okay, guys, open to you again. Uh, who's got the microphones at the minute? <laughs> Can we just get the mics to people, please? That'd be great with the hands up. Thank you. And someone on this side as well. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, um, my question is for Andy Garcia. Um, Mamma Mia is quite a departure from your previous role. Um, how was it like to be part of a musical? And uh, how much singing did you have to learn? I mean in terms of your preparation, the whole experience. I mean, you, we know you for different roles. <laughs> uh, I think it's like anything else, any part, and you start from scratch and you start building, you know, the character. I think for, for one of the, the, certainly the challenges of singing with, with Cher, well, I should say she sang, I chimed in a little bit, but, uh, but that's, you know, that's always, even though music been a tremendous part of my life, it's not the first time I sing or, but you still have to cater to you know, the tonalities of that song and, and be supportive in, in that song. So that was a challenge. But also, the, as uh, we were talking about the backstory, you know, how to fill the backstory of the relationship, you know, how powerful was such a powerful love song, you know, of longing and 
that, you know, trying to remember those moments in life that, that meant so much to you, not only the connection on the love side, but also the fact that they were involved in this sort of hypothetical revolution together. And so this is heavy stuff, you know, for, for uh, so I just tried to kind of lose myself in that, you know, as, as deeply as I could. And, and hopefully the, uh, the, the acting gods would inspire you on, in, in that moment right before the take, you know, because it, it all in films is not like theater where you, you're kind of gearing up for that one little moment where the cameras, you get to explore the character in a very short period of time and in a couple of takes here and that, and then it's gone. So you kind of try to time yourself to reach, to, you know, set everything up for it somehow for that inspiration to be, have resonance. And that's, you know, that's what I, but the song takes you there. The story in the song gives you the challenge, gives you the, the, the you know, it's like Robert Browning said, you know, the uh, one's reach should be greater than his, than his grasp or what's the heaven for. In the story of Fernando and Ruby, in this case, it's a very intense backstory, and you just try to reach for it as best you can, you know. Great, thank you so much. Can I just say, in terms of Andy getting into it, and this is a kind of metaphor for how he was and how everybody was in the whole movie, at the end of the movie when they do Super Trooper, he came in and his job was to help share up the steps onto the stage, and he said, what do I do now? And I said, I guess you just melt away. And he said, I'd really like to stay and dance. And I was like, great. And so if you watch the movie again, and we'd love it if you did, behind Cher's left shoulder is Andy getting down. The middle of the and it was a testament both to him, but also that's what everybody did. That was the extraordinary thing about doing this. It was a tribute to him and everybody. We have it on, um, on good authority, actually, from the previous press conference, Pierce, that on the first day of filming, you were skipping in, um, in preparation for... Yes, I, I, I prepared uh, for months my skipping. <laughs> Santa Monica Mountains will never be the same. Um, but well, I showed up for work on the first day, and, and there was beautiful Julie and Christine and about 200 dancers in the olive groves and five, six cameras, and uh, it, you know, it was just dancing queen and just had to dance. And oh, Amanda was in front, and all said, OK, well, we're just dance and the next thing as I was skipping and uh, I was skipping for weeks on end and I, I tried many variations of skipping but in the end it was just good old Irish skipping <laughs> you know that's it really you have to throw yourself into this you cannot be shy Mm. What a great first day to throw yourself back into it. Oh, it was brilliant. That. It was brilliant. And I, the, the, it's just the warmth of everybody and uh, the friendships that have been created uh, from the first movie to this movie uh, is, is just wonderful to see. And uh, this man here all oh, really gave us all the space and the place to be ourselves and enjoy the moment. Thank you. I can also sort of follow on from that. I mean, that the for us lot coming into this cold, so to speak, to see, you know, it, it's a very naked thing to get up there and suddenly dance and sing, especially when you're in um, sort of spandex that does make you look as if you are naked. So to see, you know, sort of guys like, that we've, you know, grown up looking up to, like Pierce and Colin and Stone and Andy, you know, throwing themselves in, then, uh, yeah, kind of met, let us kind of do the same. Mm -hmm. great. I have a question for Dominique and for Bjorn. Uh, Dominique, how did you, experience recording One of Us, because it's a very emotional song that you did in a duet with uh, Amanda, and I would like to know how did you prepare for it? I was honored to realize when I read the script that that was the song that I'd been given that wasn't, is not originally a duet and was so for the, for the film. I loved the song already and then noticed very quickly actually how quite difficult it was to sing. Um, <laughs> What I was made aware of yet again by how incredible this music is and how it has spanned m more generations than anything, the fact that five-year-olds know all the lyrics and so do 65-year-olds. And it's a very emotive song. And when I was slightly struggling with it in the studio, um, I'm not sure you were there that day, Benny was there that yeah. day. Yeah. And it's funny how your voice does different things in different moments. And it was, I was feeling quite emotional anyway, but I just wasn't managing it. 
and it was being in the studio. You have a glass box in front of you. You're at a very, very famous studio in London called Air Studios. It's beautiful and the best orchestras, the best musicians, the best bands have recorded in. And then you have ABBA watching you <laughs> destroy like, their um, pieces of art. <laughs> and uh, you start sweating and panicking and feeling nauseous. <laughs> and no one knows what to do. <laughs> and, then, and then actually Bjorn, um, Benny came out and said, you've sung this perfectly before. Why don't, look, just, and he got behind the piano. And I was using a click track, and you're in a very dead-sounding space. Like, we all think we sound wonderful when we sing in the shower, and that's because we have this wonderful sort of echoing reverb. When you're in the dead space and you have a click track, it's, you sound very different, and you're hearing yourself back. So we went outside, and he, he played it on the grand piano and just said, just relax and sing it how you normally do. And he built the, a temporary booth and put up some sound boards, and we recorded it like that. And it was, it was a joy and, and a pleasure to have been instructed by <laughs> one of the creators of, of the, this piece of music. And I, I constantly feel utterly honoured to be having been allowed to sing any of the music. And as we were saying earlier, and as you were answering earlier, nothing has greater impact and I've realized this more and more each day after the 10 years of having done the first, how incredibly this has impacted people's lives through extraordinarily tough, and we're just a small fraction of that in terms of making the film. The music has done that for, since 1974. Jesus. And that, that, <laughs> that is quite an astonishing thing. You, think, yeah. you suddenly think of it and it's like a, a, a modern piece, of, it's like, a, it's like a, a classical piece of artwork or a wonderful novel. It's, it's art and because it, it's, it's like you said, it's saved people, it's affected people. And I didn't realise, I thought this is a kind of, this is a massive, this is just a fun, this is a laugh, this is something to enjoy, and that, which we all did, but I only now really realise the truth, and, and more so with this film, which even has, is embedded in more reflection and um, reaffirms what we do in life and what happens to us and uh, the emotional journey that we embark upon from the moment we're here. And I think that, that to have that impact on people and to, to have helped save people is, is an astonishing thing that we are all lucky enough to have stolen a bit of from you. Sorry, more pressure for when you look at yourself in the morning in that mirror. <laughs> Bjorn, how does it feel? I don't to know what to say after this. <laughs> well, how, how does it feel when you see your own lyrics being transposed to the big screen? How does it feel emotionally? Uh, it's quite wonderful because uh, they all do something with it themselves, something that comes out of them. And I enjoy that so much. Um, and uh, whether they sing very well or not doesn't matter. It's, uh, it all comes out the, the right way anyway, I think. Um, and it was also a joy to slightly tweak the ly lyrics I had written um, 30, 40 years ago for the last two scenes uh, of, of the movie. Because uh, I love working within that frame of knowing what I have to say in between A and Z and telling a story. It was, we had great fun, all and I, bouncing back and forth. It's the scariest thing to, one, to ask Bjorn to rewrite a lyric, <laughs> and then when he sends the rewrite to go, this is wonderful, but is, could you do any better? That was a terrifying <laughs> And then he wrote back immediately going, I'll try. And, I was like, and then I got something back two minutes later, and I was like, yeah, that's sensational. I mean, it's amazing for me. I'd like to say something about Mr. Parker, and I'm sure everybody on this table would, would agree. And, and uh, we, we both had the blessing, a lot of the older guys on the table, to be working in this in this art form for many years and, and experienced a lot of directors over the years. And Al is uh, really one of the, I say, uh, well, I say he has a bright future. <laughs> uh, he is an extraordinarily sensitive individual, uh, so in tune with what's going on with you as an actor in a very effortless, effortless way. Uh, the, the one thing I could say is that every time I would do something, he would come to me and say, that was brilliant, that was brilliant. But then he would also say that when they brought him a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it quickly, my, you know, I was reduced down to the level of a hot cup of tea. So I didn't know how to process his, uh, his, uh, his support. But uh, 
I would say that Al is uh, really one of the one of the uh, the great experiences I've had over the years, and I've had the blessing of had many. You know, Amazing. he's also a little lot too honest at times. I remember one take I did take that I knew was awful, and it happens every now and again. And I went up to Al and I said that that wasn't great, was it? And he went, well, stars won't shine without darkness. <laughs> 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 and then this gentleman here for a question. Uh, Jamie from Gay Star News here. This is a question for Jorn. <clears throat> um, how, has, how did the process of working on the film and revisiting these iconic songs, uh, how did it inspire and inform the possibility of new ABBA music in the future? Um, well, I, the, the new music that we've written, uh, was really inspired by a, a project that we're in where we're building heads that are copies of our heads from 1979. And we thought that those heads must something, have something new to sing. So we wrote two new songs and, and um, we went into the studio with the ladies and uh, it was a fantastic experience. We've never been in a studio together for, since we split up in, in 82. And uh, we sort of, you know, looked around and this situation is so incredibly familiar. <laughs> and it took seconds and we were back, you know, like yesterday. And yes, it was great fun doing, doing that again. And the strange thing is that um, when those two ladies start singing together, there is that sound which is not like any other sound. Mm -hmm. It's just happened that way. Uh, it's just coincidence that we should meet and that those two can make that sound together, which is the ABBA sound. Well, there's the third film sorted anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Just a soundtrack for the this. third film. Um, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for your questions and for being here today. Thank you to our wonderful panel and thank you for your wonderful film. Can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you, thank you gentlemen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from the Goonies? Yeah. Nice. Hey!